Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, after a, a short break, we will now move to the second uh, session. As you know, we, we will um, uh, we, we'll stay with this for uh, another hour, and I hope you can stay with us um, uh, for, for the uh, second session, which, as I said earlier, deals with cultural ecosystems and social values. And our first presenter, we have three presenters again here. Our first presenter is Kate Flood, who is a, a PhD candidate in uh, NUIG. And Kate looks at um, how social science, ecology, and humanities interact and intersect with each other in exploring the relationships between people and, and peatlands, where she focuses on the values of nature and the processes by which these values emerge at community levels. I think her research has obviously enormous significance for peatlands, but it has wider significance in terms of how individuals and communities relate to their wider environment. So I'm going to hand it to you, Kate. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Tom, and good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks to the Water Forum for organizing this webinar and for the opportunity to speak today. So the focus of this report is on water quality and benefits for climate and bi biodiversity. And these, of course, are the big issues of our time. But peatlands also have these social and cultural values which provide us with a range of benefits for our health and well-being. So um, our, our management and policies for peatlands should reflect all of these wide variety of benefits and values. So the report itself goes into more detail about all, all these sorts of debates around how we define and measure cultural services. So I'm gonna focus here on the recommendations and priority one, which is to include social and cultural values in peatland management and enhancing stakeholder collaboration. So, these are the four overriding recommendations um, under priority one, and essentially they're all linked around the idea of how we can better include social dimensions in peatland management and conservation in order to support this shift to more collaborative forms of governance and reimagine peatland management for the future. So I'll, I'll look at each of these in turn. Um, but first, just to, to kind of look at why, you know, this particular focus on social and cultural values and social dimensions. IPIS are known as the IPCC for biodiversity. And in their global assessment, they identify these direct and indirect drivers of change and uh, what Flo talked about, all the, the land uses and human activity as being underpinned by societal values and behaviours. So understanding values is critical for the, the types of transformative change that we need. So the first recommendation is around encouraging research from social sciences, humanities and the arts. And this is when commissioning and designing research calls for peatlands, because this type of broad sort of disciplinary research is essential to understand all of these different types of phenomena, social processes, and attributes like values, beliefs, and behaviors, all of which have such a critical influence on the outcome of conservation and peatland management. And this kind of knowledge integration can achieve conservation that's more ecologically effective and socially just. So this idea, I suppose, Flo talked about combining our knowledge and developing shared knowledge of different areas of peatland expertise. And it's important, I think, to recognize the, the diversity of different types of knowledge. And rather than this kind of binary between scientific and local knowledge or expert and non-expert, because you could have an NPWS ranger who has really important local knowledge or a member of a local community that has very detailed ecological knowledge from years of carrying out surveys in one particular place. So recognizing all these different types of knowledge enables the kind of social learning that's needed to help us adapt and move away from kind of more oppositional approaches to developing a sort of a, a shared sen sense of responsibility. So in terms of what this might look like, these, this, this kind of integrating knowledge, and these are just a few examples, the IPAS framework at a global scale is emphasizing the importance of local and indigenous knowledge alongside scientific knowledge. Um, the Bogland report from 2011 had a very strong social science strand. 
Um, the, this Wetland Life Project from the UK, I'm including because it, it includes subjects across this continuum uh, from uh, ecological surveys, economic valuation, history, social science, photography, and art. Also, um, the, the social barriers and opportunities to implementing the England Peat Strategy. This is a 100 page report specifically just looking at the social aspects of the strategy to try and enhance its implementation. Um, the People in Peatlands project is just one new project in Ireland looking at behaviour change, just transition and has social and cultural strands. There are lots more life projects, EIP projects. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't mention them all, but um, of course, I, I do have to give a, a mention to the Community Wetlands Forum. And we did a bit of an audit yesterday of kind of skills and disciplines in, in the, the group. And we have scientists, ecologists, biologists, botanists, artists, community volunteers, media people, government agency staff. So we counted over 30 different uh, disciplines and expertise. So it's a really diverse knowledge base and network of, of people coming together and sharing knowledge. And of course, this current research call as well, I'd like to commend the Water Forum for including this work on social and cultural values. So the second section then uh, focuses on cultural ecosystem services. And in the diagram from the Millennium Assessment, you can see how economic, ecological and cultural values map onto provisioning, regulating cultural services. And then these in turn are mapped onto um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is a model of human well-being and basically what people need to survive and thrive. And um, it talks about the concept of cultural ecosystem services is a simple one. People need and benefit from contact with nature and these benefits should be recognized in policy and practice. So it, it is a simple concept in some ways, but as soon as we try to start measuring it, it becomes quite complex. So um, the, the, just about in terms of data sources to support mapping and assessment of cultural services of peatlands, um, Appendix 1 in the report provides a kind of a reference list of peatland cultural ecosystem services based on the CICES categories. So it's really just a starting point for, for thinking about cultural services of peatlands. Um, the Mays report by the NPWS recommended a data gap analysis uh, more generally for cultural ecosystem services and the in-case project will be developing cultural services accounts at catchment scale and three of those catchments have peatland cover. Um, in terms of kind of generating new sources of data, given that often these kind of social and shared group values are, are hidden or implicit, um, they can only emerge sometimes through methods that encourage discussion and deliberation. So that kind of mix of quantitative and qualitative is important. Looking at just very briefly at kind of developing indicators for cultural services, it's still very much an under-researched area and there is a, a lack of indicators for cultural services like inspiration and spiritual benefits for obvious reasons. Um, valuation tends to be biased towards more easily measured cultural services such as recreation and ecotourism, which can have this effect of deepening the gap between counting that which matters to people and that which is easy to measure. So it's just making the point here that the indicators and metrics that we use matter, the processes by which we develop them matter and in involving stakeholders improves uh, the quality of these indicators. So one approach that's uh, used and talked about a lot is crowdsource data um, with social media, which allows you to look at people's kind of interactions and aesthetic enjoyment of landscapes. And they do provide um, rich sources of data, but of course they have biases. They might only represent um, a part of the population that's digitally literate or uh, more tourists than local people. Um, and there are also issues around data privacy. So essentially you just need to use multiple methodologies when you're capturing any kind of information about uh, cultural services. So in terms of identifying the impact of um, the ecological status of peatlands on the provision of cultural services and then on the flip side the impact of demand for cultural services on peatlands and it's a kind of a supply and demand. So 
you know, even in the past year, we've seen this huge increase in visitor numbers um, to places, amenities like peatlands. And that obviously ha can have impacts on the landscape and the biodiversity. Um, the top images is a choice experiment that was done in Scotland. And it has the big three, but it didn't include social and cultural values. So it's really important, um, as Flo mentioned, about the, the kind of diagram that, you know, all of these things are included. Otherwise, you're, you're just not getting a full picture of all of these um, benefits and values. So moving on then to, to the third recommendation, which is around enhancing collaboration with stakeholders. And the short survey that we did highlighted this as a big issue. And we know that more collaborative forms of governance has multiple benefits. And recent research has shown that increases in ecosystem services happen when more community-based multi-stakeholder approaches are taken. So we created this um, stakeholder map of Irish peatlands, and it's very much a first step in describing the variety of people and organizations involved in peatland management. So the, the who, um, but it doesn't. Um, so the next recommendation is more around identifying pathways for collaboration and, and the quality of those relationships. So social network analysis is one tool to do that. Um, it looks at the, the quality of the relationships, the um, kind of information flows between people, patterns of engagement and, and power dynamics. And you can see in the diagram there, it's from research that was uh, carried out, I think, in uh, Yorkshire. And it shows, you know, who's kind of talking to who, you know, the recreationists are out on their own, um, the water industry and the conservationists, the grouse managers and the farmers. So um, I think it's a useful tool to use to um, uh, explore that a little bit further. Another way to enhance collaboration is looking at um, supporting all these networks of people and, you know, creating or supporting existing organisations that are have this bridging uh, effect. So um, a national peatland group could could do that. And um, these kind of organisations link stakeholders very strategically. They connect vertically and horizontally and um, have this kind of systems perfect perspective so you're you're generating social ecological knowledge to support learning um, and they can mobilize stakeholders and resources and build trust so again on on collaborative governance um the research tells us that early engagement and collaboration you know makes um uh, these kind of engagement processes more successful. And, you know, there are different degrees of participation depending on the goals of a project. So sometimes it is enough to inform or consult, but really we should be aspiring to involve and empower people and collaborate in more meaningful, longer lasting ways. And successful community engagement, it, it is more of a long-term process. It's not a single event of filling out a form or even a series of events, although, these forms of consultation do have a place. Um, it should really take place over time to build relationships and capacity and trust. Um, and, it, you know, it's not easy. It does require very particular skills and expertise. And I think this expertise should be acknowledged. So moving away from coming up with a plan and asking the public what they think of it towards emphasizing the process of decision making as much as the outcome. So just then in terms of some of the mechanisms um, that can be used and, you know, there's there's no shortage of guidance on designing and facilitating effective public engagement, including the Water Forum's own death study. Um, but one of the things in terms of peatlands, you know, establishing long term monitoring uh, that integrates citizen science and local communities, building local capacity, as Flo mentioned, to restore peatlands and in some cases where appropriate, looking at, you know, models of ownership such as the uh, and, and leasing such as the Abbey Leaks Bog Project and similar to schemes in Scotland and community owned woodlands. Developing these strong multi -stakeholder, stakeholder partnerships and building on networks like the, the Wetlands Forum and the, the PPNs um, in this kind of very much a two way process of information sh sharing and ensuring that everyone has an equal place at the table. Um, so, 
uh, the la the then encouraging the public sector organisations to have dedicated community liaison staff. I think this is a really important one, and I see that the Heritage Office is recruiting a community and public engagement officer. But other agencies with responsibility for nature conservation should do the same and acknowledge the expertise that is involved. And then looking at action research approaches. So that is research that is initiated and driven by communities um, alongside um, academic researchers. So this diagram then um, shows a really diverse overview of public engagement approaches and where they happen on the, the policy cycle. And looking at this, you can see that consultation is just one small part of this overall approach to public engagement. And you can probably understand then how we're ranking so low for civic engagement and stakeholder engagement. Oh, that's my uh, timer. So um, I suppose we have all the guidance and knowledge we need. So really, as was said during the week by Dr. Catherine Farrell, we just have to roll up our sleeves and work together across sectors and do it. Um, so just to conclude then, um, I suppose call me an idealist, but I'd like to think we're moving towards an Ireland where the role of public policy is to promote community and ecological well-being. And that is um, communities of life in very much the broadest sense. So I think values, engagement and focusing on well-being are key to this transition. You know, what kinds of values are relevant to society? What values do current management reflect? Um, in terms of engagement, do we want to inform and consult or collaborate and empower? And healthy peatlands are essential for our own health and well-being in ways I think that we're only just beginning to understand. So moving towards a well-being economy, you know, Ireland is developing a well-being framework. And um, I think that's a really uh, good step and reflects what's happening uh, globally and nationally. So I'll leave it there. Um, I think my time is up and um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, at the end of the session. Thanks very much, Kate. Uh, I think your, um, your um, classification of co-define or co-define, I should say, co-design, co-create and co-deliver has relevance not just um, regard to peatlands, I think it has substantial relevance with regard to the entirety of the interplay between uh, environmental management and stakeholder engagement and consultation, and is particularly useful, I think, to the forum itself. So thank you for that. Um, our second presenter is Chris East. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Chris. Chris is a native of Namibia, uh, but has been living in, in Ireland for the last 20 years. Uh, his educational background is in the world of communications, but he's, he's going to talk to us today about his involvement with the Abbey Leaks uh, Bog project, which, of course, Kate referred to in her presentation. So, uh, Chris, I'm going to hand it to you, and thank you for being here, and uh, we look forward to great interest to looking at this case study. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. It is, it is a wonderful opportunity to share a little bit. Thank you so much for Flo and David and Derek and uh, Kate, who gives us all the theoretical uh, context to all of this. So I don't have to explain all of that. All I can do is just nice slide in there and tell you how all this work within all of those contexts and how communities can actually do it and how does it work on the ground. It is a privilege to do it. Um, and if I'm doing this today about Abelix Bob, just also think about all the other community groups, all the other people within the community of Atlantis Forum, community groups all over the country that is working by, with community-led conservation in all sorts of places, not only on peatlands and wetlands, but in other forms as well. As well, the NGOs and people, and also farmers and individual people that has a great love for the environment. So what I'm going to do is trying to give you an overview of what has been happening in the last 10 years. It's going to be positive. I'm not going to tell you the obstacles and the problems and the issues and all the things that makes life difficult. I'm going to tell you what has been working and how all the things that the other speakers have been talking about this today has come together 
and, and how it operates and probably you'll understand better. Okay, um, it seems to me my, oh, there you go. Um, I, I'm just gonna start with this and this will be the theme of the whole presentation is that I think it's the way we look at our land which will determine how we, we treat it. And I think if we treat it as part of our community as, an, as part of the system that we live in, then we will respect it. Although Leopold is an uh, esteemed environmentalist in the America, and he was in the early, uh, early 20th century. Anyway, let's move on. Um, yes, just to give you the context of this whole project, if you look at that photograph, you might see all the impact of our humans on a piece of land that is about only two square kilometers or 200 hectares or 500 acres, whichever way you prefer it. Um, this side, you can see the effect of the human impact. You can see farming, you can see uh, land, other land users. Uh, you can see drains, you can see forestry. You can see all sorts of things, roads and systems, but you can also see on the corner, left corner, you might see the remnants or the buildings there, which is the town of Avalik. So it shows you how close the town and the village is. The railway track right through the middle gives access to the site. And the one thing you don't see on this is actually the multiple um, matrices of, matrices of, of hydro, hydrological areas or the water areas or habitats or any of the biodiversity. But let's have a look at, at how that works and how that uh, come together. Uh, just another perspective, 50% of the site is a peatland uh, or the, uh, is, is, peat, uh, is, is a high raised bog area. And you can actually see the drains that was put in in the 80s to drain the bog, actively drain the raised bog area. The interesting thing is now you start to see the water and the capacity for a peatland to actually absorb the water. Uh, so this, the, the raised bog area here is absorbing all the water from precipitation or rainfall, but you also will have other areas um, that uh, are other ways of sources of water. So let's just have a look at, um, at the first area, which is raised bog, which is, the, the key to this whole um, area of, of us to, to restore or to rehabilitate or to look after or to conserve. And uh, this is uh, depending on the water that comes, which is rain, which is acidic, which actually then in, in turn gives uh, obviously the, the type of plants that uh, will, will grow on that with low nutrition. Then you also have water coming off the eskers and the surrounding areas which is uh, uh, um, surface water in drains, uh, in streams, and that flows in the form of different habitats and different areas of interest. And uh, that gives you your second uh, input into water or, or um, the, the wetness of the area. Then you have another big area, which is uh, around the bog, another 50% of the area is all old cutaway areas that forms their own habitats, that is starting to form their own sort of uh, micro habitats. And they all uh, basically have their own uh, different type of plant species and biodiversity. Um, in, in this whole area or this whole site then is primarily aimed at supporting biodiversity. So we have the water that determines habitats and the habitats in turn uh, su supports and actually helps to, to create the biodiversity, not only for plants, but also for insects. In this case, you can see the, the variety of butterflies that you possibly can see 23 different species on Abelix bog. Then also other insects, which is important, the pollinators and so forth. Um, so that, that gives you the broad context about biodiversity and the habitats and that it is not a simple uh, straightforward island of, of habitat, but there's a lot of supporting habitats around it that help and support the whole process and also the, the functionality of the site. And hence, from, from our point of view, it is also too important that we understand and map and see and, and, and get to better uh, uh, respect this whole area. 
And that's why the whole process with Avalix Bog is that we have a, a, um, a whole a team of people that we use their knowledge and we brought them together in a technical advisory group where we actually share information, knowledge, and also try to have it science-based as much as possible on our decisions, what we, what we do. And hence the whole site has been divided in, on the left-hand side, you will see in hydrological zones. And these hydrological zones is obviously the influence of the uh, water flows and where the water comes from, and in turn, the impact on the, the habitats around it. And here's a photograph about the drain blocking in 2009, which was one of the first things that happened uh, as soon as it could. And that had a profound effect and we will get to that. And then each of these hydrological zones, we've uh, bring in eco ecologists over the last couple of years to inform us as to the micro habitats that is within the, all of these zones and how that micro habitats could be impacted if we do any restoration work or rehabilitation work or conservation work. So this is for us to help inform our decisions. Then uh, from, from the Raysbok area, it is, it is important that you um, see how, how the, 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 the rehabilitation work or conservation work has benefited the site. Here you will see the, the high bog area that has been, uh, the drains were blocked in 2009 and you do an ecotope survey that actually sort of see how many plants and the different plant species that, that, is, that is involved. I think there's about 12 species that you look at and how they, they work in, together with each other and how they appear in what format. And that gives you how active or how uh, healthy the bog is. You can see 2009 and the bluer the site, the more healthier the site is. So you can see where we started off in 2009. Look at 2014 and it was repeated in 2020. And now you can see there was a major change over 11 years. And that is what uh, Flo and David has been talking about. Once you start re-wetting and you, you manage your, your water tables, it immediately has an impact on the vegetation. Now let's just trans transpose that into, uh, and, and uh, so see how, the eco -hydrolog hydrological work that has been done in a PhD research between Clara and Abelix Bog, how you can translate that ecotope into possible way of understanding how much carbon you can do. Um, and, and it is purely, this, this tab table here is purely to do with uh, uh, direct carbon emissions, uh, CO2 emissions. It doesn't look at the NH, NH4s uh, and it doesn't look at your dissolved organic carbon, but it just gives an, 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 an area, or gives you an understanding. If you look at 2009 to 2020, uh, your central ecotope, subcentral, which is where, what you want to get to, is your active raised bog. You can see the increase from 2009 to 2020 is about by 12 and a half uh, percentage points. And if you translate then your emissions on the different type of habitats or the diff different type of um, ecotopes, you will see then how the CO2 has diminished since 2009 and the total has come down for more or less, more, more than half over the last 11 years. So that, that gives you a an, an way of bringing science together with what you do uh, on the ground. Uh, then we as, as the community group as well has, because we have all of this data that coming to us and, and then from ecologists and specialists and experts and stuff, we now recently has bought our own um, uh, GIS, GNNS uh, equipment so that we can actually start using this data and interpret it ourselves and actually start using our own data as well. And here we started to use the data now uh, our equipment, which is sub-zero, um, sub-meter uh, sub accuracy to map each and every PDAM that was done on the, ra on the race block and the high block area. Here's just the start and show you all the dots as a PDAM. There's about 3,300 3, plus PDAMs on the race block. But we wanted to have it accurate because you want to make uh, qualitative or quantitative decisions in the future, how to add or improve the restoration work. In, in collaboration with our uh, experts. So 
that gives the biodiversity, that gives the science, that gives the uh, collaborations with other specialists and experts about rehabilitation and, and, and um, restoration work. But let's look how the community got involved and the community good. Now, there was great excitement the last week or so about the cranes that are starting to come back to Ireland. Um, just a bit of news is that we scooped all of that because in 2000, we also had a crane on, 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 on Abelix Bog. It's not a similar crane as a bird, but there's a crane here in the background with yellow that actually stopped Port Namona uh, from actually coming in with their big uh, machinery to actually harvest the bog. And this is where the community started to come to the fore because it has been regarded as a natural capital of a natural heritage area. And this is where the community started to galvanize behind the project. Since then, and uh, uh, we've we signed a lease agreement for 50 years to manage the place. Since then, a lot of things have been happening. Community is getting involved with events and workshops, which we've had multiple of them, whether it is with Heritage Week or with bio blitzes or with just workshops uh, and so forth. Then, obviously, community involvement, volunteers in terms of infrastructure built. We've, uh, the community volunteers, uh, we see a couple of them there, has been building 1.7 kilometers of bog bridge, which is the year in the background here, you can see it, and the boardwalk uh, that we've built about 300 meters. So that's all done by voluntary labor. Uh, then we also have massive stakeholder collaborations. Uh, we work with too many to mention. If I mention one, I'm going to be lynched by all the others. But in the end of the day, as I also don't want to do here an exercise of, of logos, uh, I, I, what I want to emphasize here is that when you work with stakeholders, you work actually with individuals, you work with people within that organization, and they determine how good your, your, your relationship with that organization is. So I'm not going to mention organizations or institutions of people. We have over uh, 50 different institutions, organizations, local groups and people that we interface or work with over the, with different projects and different issues. So here's just a flavor of it. Um, then the arts, uh, visual and performing arts, is also interlinking with, with the project, uh, with art, with the local uh, further education center students that come there regularly, with art projects that they do with us. There's also the local leash youth uh, dancing ensemble that has been doing some videos there. Um, just uh, create, recreation and well-being absolutely important. That's although it's it, it is a secondary uh, objective of the project is to provide that amenity for people. It is it is the conservation that's important. But just interestingly, we did a visitor age profile and the visitor profile uh, on the twenty fourth of April. We just sat down there and counted the people. It was a good day. This is most probably uh, one of the top numbers that you will have. And you, the total number is about 680 people between 8.30 in the morning and four o'clock in the afternoon who visit the site. So it brings additional pressures. And this is since COVID, people are looking for places to go for a walk, for a run, to, to, to just get out. Um, and uh, that had an, an, another impact. Uh, and I will come back to that as well. But people, I, I think this is important that we understand this and that people uh, want to connect back with the nature and the environment. Um, let me just give you one example of how the social economic benefit of a project. The hotel next door has uh, been good to us for the last 20 odd years on the project, where they facilitate us to, do a, to use their car park because you can walk from the hotel car park into the project. Last year in COVID, the hotel had to close. And uh, they've seen that there was about 50 people at that time coming a day to go for a walk, 50 cars. They capitalized on that to bring a little caravan to sell coffees and teas and stuff. Now, a year later, precisely a year later, you have a whole new infrastructure that has been built there, platform based on the, the old railway system that was there. 
and now platform 77 and Polly's is a new business outlet where they sell coffees and teas to the people coming. And that in itself has brought more people into it. So that is an indirect uh, social economic benefit of the place. Right. So I've, I've, I've run through uh, the, the broad things here. Um, in the end, you have to look at all of that in, in uh, you can't look at one aspect in isolation. It's all integrated. It's all about it's all about the um, the 2030 uh, sustainable development goals, which is all integrated. It's all about people and and well-being and living well and bringing all of these things together. But conservation is not. It's a complex system. It's not simple. It's not easy, and uh, it is connected with our well-being as humans. And I think we need to understand that. But Neither is community-based conservation mm -hmm. nor government state-based conservation the panacea or the answer for it. It is like being eluded by other people. It, is a, it, it should be a multiple partners and linkages and working together because conservation, the environment is complex. Although uh, climate change is six gases and the answers are all there, it's a complex issue in the sense of we all have to do something, otherwise it comes to nothing. When we're talking about biodiversity and restoration of the environment, it is complex, but the moment you do something about it, it has immediate impact for biodiversity, for ecosystem services, and I do something for climate. And that has been proven. But for this to happen, this multi-stakeholder multi approach to happen, there needs to be some things that needs to come together. And uh, Kate has also uh, alluded to this, is, has, been, has been recommended in a desktop study by the Water Forum is include communities and individuals. Uh, and if I talk communities, I'm talking farmers and I'm talking about the communitarian sector. The communitarian sector is including the civic societies, the ENGOs, NGOs, people representing communities, uh, all of these fora that needs to be brought in from the beginning and in decision-making. And then they also need to the, address the, the power relationship and the participatory process. And I talk participatory process, not consultative process. We need to be part of the process. We all bring something unique to it. And then also obviously uh, trust, accountability, uh, it is important, it is key. If you don't have trust, you don't have relationships between people and people, relationships between people bring relationships between stakeholders. And then the silos of knowledge about sharing. And uh, Kate showed the equality, equity thing here. We want justice, there mustn't be obstacles and, and involved. We should be all be equally sharing. Um, thank you for, for people to listen. I just want to say that, um, um, we, this collaboration and collaborative approaches is, is, is existing in other parts of the world and has been used very much so. And that is what the Community Wetlands Forum wants to do, is to bring the, all the stakeholders together. And we could be the nanotechnology, small projects all over the country, working in collaboration with bigger projects and be ancillary to that. Just transition is moving away but you, can't, you can only move people and people to need people to move, you need to empower them and make them, enable them to make a difference and not just telling them what to do. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a truly inspiring project. I think you're probably looking at 400 extra visitors this year of all the 400 people we've had here today. So thank you for it. We're running a bit a bit uh, late on our time, um, but I think this, this presentation will be worth waiting for. We have to finish at 12.30. Um, and before, Stephen, you might just give us an indication of what the way the poll is working out. So 63% are optimistic. Well, Okay, well, 
it's nice to think there's there's hope out there. Uh, our last uh, speaker today is Tina Claffey. Uh, Tina is an award-winning Irish nature photographer and author of Tapestry of Light, Ireland's Bogs and Wetlands as Never Seen Before. And uh, I mean, can you do a more uh, uh, specific uh, introduction than that? So hey, Tina, I'm going to hand it to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. And uh, thanks to all at the Water Forum and for inviting me to, to participate in this amazing seminar. Um, I want to take you on a little journey through the bog, uh, through my eyes, well, through the macro lenses eyes. Um, just a little bit about myself first. Um, I went to art college in Cork and graduated with a degree in fine art photography and then went on to work as an assistant to a fashion and product photographer in Cork City. Um, but my love of nature photography really began in Africa, Botswana. Oh, yeah. Couldn't intervene, how? Where I lived for almost 10 years in pristine wilderness locations. Um, there I was taught really the importance of observation, of slowing down and using all of my senses to survive in the bush. So I returned to Ireland in 2009 and I had to sit very lost. Wild places, I missed the wilderness. And a walk in my local bog with botanist John Fehan back in 2009 kick-started my fascination with this wilderness. My memories of the bog were of a dead place, of a place that not full of life. Um, and while I walked with John Fehan, he gave, along this boardwalk in Cologne, um, he gave me a hand lens. And as he was walking and talking, he was scooping up mosses and he was scooping up lichens and plants and spiders. He was encouraging me to look through the lens at what, I, at, at what he had given me. And it absolutely blew my mind. Um, it, it amazed me to realize that I really was walking on a living, breathing carpet. So I invested in a macro lens and a macro lens is basically like that eyeglass. It allows me to photograph species up close and reveal the beauty of this wilderness. So I'm gonna take you a little, on a little journey through this um, bog and through many of the bogs in the Midlands, which I've been exploring for the last 10 years. So this is sphagnum moss and what's really not to love about sphagnum moss, uh, there are so many species. This is sphagnum cuspidatum or feathery bog moss um, in the bright sunshine in Scohoboy bog in Tipperary. And this is what I call nature's eye. Um, this is frog spawn the first signs of life in the spring. The sun was shining and it lit a reed below the surface, illuminating one cell of frog spawn. And through the macro lens, it appeared that an eye was looking back at me, the eye of mother nature herself, I think. And this is the marsh marigold in bloom right now, if you visit your local bog. Um, it's the first flower really to appear within the bog and lets us know that the bog is, is well and truly awake um, this flower supplies much needed nectar for the emerging insects. And you might be wondering what this is, or this, this is actually created by an insect, believe it or not. And it's surely one of the greatest architects in the bog, and it's the caddisfly. It builds this amazing structure from reeds, which houses its delicate, soft, aquatic larval body. And this creation protects its body from predators as it develops and the weight of it keeps it submerged. So this caddisfly has gained its wings and it leaves its house behind. And we have so many species of moth and butterflies in the bog. This is a dark tussock moth um, caterpillar. It's feasting on bog cotton. But I was fascinated this day by its little feet as it moved up and down the stalk of the plant. And surely one of our most magnificent moths in our peatlands is the emperor moth. I was, I was photographing this freshly emerged female when she was joined by a male, which is much smaller, for mating. Seemingly the male can detect a female from kilometers away. So I felt truly privileged to be able to not alone see this, but to document it. And this is bog bean, just coming into bloom now as well. Um, such a stunning little plant um, with its amazing hairy petals. And of course, this is bog rosemary, which is the county flower of Offaly, where I'm from, here in Burr. 
Um, so this is bog rosemary, um, which produces this most delicate and tiny little flower. And also in bloom now is Lady Smock, also known as the cuckoo flower and aptly named as the cuckoo flower as now is the time for the cuckoo. You'll hear the cuckoo now in the bog. So this beautiful flower is one of the main food sources of the orange tip butterfly that lay their eggs on, on the plant. And this is one of the eggs on the top part there. Most incredible um, little egg. And uh, I just managed to photograph one of a, a little caterpillar, a little orange tip caterpillar that had just emerged. Um, so the little tiny caterpillar proceeded to eat that egg case and uh, go on to feed off the plant. And then we have the sundew, um, one of the most iconic plants in the bog and truly one of my favorites. This is the round leaved sundew and it's adapted to survive in the sterile conditions on the bog. It's a deadly carnivore. Um, insects are attracted to its sweet sticky tentacles and once they land on it, they're truly doomed. Um, the tentacles close over the insect and it's digested and the sundew receives the nitrogen it needs. And this is the bog asphodel and the arrival of this beauty um, lets us know that summer is here. Um, this beauty com completely transforms to a deep orange in the autumn. So it, to me, it's like a chameleon, this plant. It's, it's the chameleon of the bog. It, it changes form. Each have their own beauty, but it, it, I think it's at its most beautiful here in the summer. And then we have our raft spider. We have many spiders in the bog, um, many create amazing webs, but not this one. This one is a hunter um, that doesn't spin webs at all. It's the largest spider in Ireland. Um, it is semi-aquatic, hunting on the water and under the water and on the, on the bog itself. Again, peatlands are a haven for our biodiversity. This is the marsh fertility, and it really is a wonderful um, example of how important our peatlands are. It had disappeared for almost 20 years, and thanks to the conservation efforts within the bog, they are thriving and doing very well again. And one would hardly really associate orchids with peatlands, but we have many species of orchids within the peatlands. This particular orchid can be found in the drier esker areas of the bog. Um, this is the amazing bee orchid. And the flower of this bee orchid resembles a bee to attract pollinators. Really is a, an incredible wonder of nature when, through, when viewed through the macro lens. And surely one of the most iconic plants in the bog is bog cotton. Um, this is hare's tail bog cotton in the last of the summer evening sun. And this one I call nature's pearls. Foggy mornings, I love foggy mornings out in the bog um, because it reveals all the hiding places and wonderful spider creations. This amazing creation of a web um, covered in morning dew um, looked like a pearl necklace. And then this is the bog asphodel as it changes to a tongue form Early autumn sure is really is one of the most magical times to visit the bog and I would encourage anyone in August of time to get out there into the bog because you have a, the heather is in bloom, there's a sea of purple and then you have the bog asphodel which has turned to its beautiful deep orange fruiting form. Now while, while most flowers in the autumn die back, um, this, the devil's bit scabious comes into bloom, the purple flower you see here. And it's an amazing um, source of food for the insects that remain. And not least is this amazing birch shield bug, um, heavily covered in morning dew. And you can, you can tell why it's called a, a shield bug, because its back literally resembles a shield. And to me, this shield bug looked like it was encrusted with jewels. Um, I thanked this beauty um, once I'd photographed it, because it felt, I was just privileged to be there at that moment to capture it. This is the devil's bit scabious in fun, full bloom, almost like an explosion of color within the bog. 
Um, and this is a hoverfly bee. It looks like a bee, but it's actually a, a fly. It's a hoverfly mimicking a bee, um, posing really nicely there for me on the scabies. And of course, the bog is also host to some amazing lichens. This is reindeer lichen, so-called because of its antler-like antler tips. So to me, this looked like this snow white lichen was like a wonderful tree nestled within the bog floor. Another amazing one is the pixie cup. Um, these two pixie cups to me look like otherworldly goblets um, lit by the morning sun. And then the bracken fern is another chameleon. Um, it changes from that lush green, which you'll find now, um, to deep orange and gold in the autumn. And this one is receding in a blaze of glory as the evening sun illuminates it. And then the bracken springs new life and the cycle of life continues over and over. Um, this is small, these small little parasols of fungi were developing out of the dead bracken. And this is devil's matchstick, which is one of our most stunning little lichens with its scarlet tips. Um, this is on a frosty morning coming into winter. Um, and to me, it looked like, like a miniature tree in this frosted landscape. And this is one of my favorite images. This is sphagnum moss, sphagnum cuspidatum, like I showed you at the start. Um, I explored the bog in mid-December ago, and um, a tiny sphagnum moss caught my eye, and it was minus four degrees, um, and the sun lit up the ice in the shallow bog pool. And when I looked through the macro lens, I, I seriously could not believe my eyes. So this frozen sphagnum was perfectly preserved in the ice as if in suspended animation, um, just surrounded by these frozen oxygen bubbles. So this is my book, Tapestry of Light, which was launched in 2017. Um, it went through the seasons, season by season, of all the flora and fauna that you would find there. It is unfortunately sold out, but I can reveal that I will have a new book out next year. Um, and if you follow me on my social media. On my website, I'll keep people updated, but um, I have on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you can contact me through those. Um, but I really hope you enjoy my presentation and I'm really delighted to be part of this amazing morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Tina, Chris, uh, Kate, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Tina, that's been an extraordinary uh, walk through the, through the bog and, and, uh, and the introduced another world, I would say, to all of us. So thank you so much for it. Um, we only have a couple of minutes. We have to finish at 12.30. Um, there, are, there, there are lots of comments coming in, I think, uh, on, on the Q&A with regard to the learnings we've had this morning from both sessions, but I suppose very particularly with regard to this one, around actually the issue of consultation and community engagement. Um, and um, I suppose citizen science, citizen involvement, new ways of looking at the world, they all merge to introduce people to a different way of being in the world and experiencing the world. And I think in the three presentations we've, we've had this morning, we have, we've been introduced to a new way of being in the bog and, uh, and being with it and exploring it. Um, I, I just want to, to ask people quickly um, if, in a sense, the, the main learning you have taken from your work around community involvement, is it... Um, what do you think is the is the key limitation? And I'm just going to give you a sentence each. Uh, what are the what's the key? To be, what are the big barriers to getting the community in there, uh, protecting their environment, and and uh, working with it? Uh, and as I said, we, we have one minute. Kate. Um, I think the key is to 
I think, um, to think, I, I think maybe just that perception of, of, you know, knowledge and, you know, equality, I suppose, at the table, equal place at the table that, um, you know, I think politically as well, a good bit still has to be done to sort of move away from, you know, we've seen a lot of online consultations and, you know, it doesn't have to be just a form, even during COVID. You can have, you know, even Airgrid have done workshops where, you know, in this kind of style. So, you know, we can do a little bit better and, and you know, talking to people builds relationships, you know, as Chris always says, having conversations uh, forms are just, you know, yes, you get your your point across maybe, but you don't know if it's being taken on board. So, you know, we don't really get feedback. We, we spend all this time filling out forms and giving knowledge and expertise. And we've no idea then sometimes in the final document, it, it doesn't appear. So just that kind of more two way um, conversation. And um, yeah, sorry. Two way conversation. I'm going to take that. Chris, a sentence. Uh, policies, uh, programs, all must enable and make it possible for communities and farmers and communitarian sector to get involved, enable them, make it possible, empower them, and they will do it. And we've proved it. And a lot of community groups are proving that. As Chris and uh, Tina. I suppose for me, it's just about getting out there. Um, spending time there, even sitting um, out there um, and appreciating what, what, what we can't lose. We must keep what we have. And I think when you, when you visit out there, when you get out there, you realise how important these areas are. That's so interesting. And I, I must say, I, I took that from the, the presentation, to, especially the two case studies you've used, Tina and, and Crystal's, the notion of being with the bog rather than being on it. Not to mention, rather than as Bornemona used that great word, harvesting, um, which is, I guess, and I know we have Bornemona representatives here, and I know they've learned a lot in the years, but I, I always felt the appropriate word there, or the more accurate word, was mining. And uh, it's, it's very good that we have left that behind, and hopefully uh, a new possibility is dawning. It's been a, an enormous pleasure to be with this exercise today. I want to ask Stephen on the final, on the poll, where, where did we come in at the end, Stephen? Which means we're leaving with hope. And I think that is significant. I think the presentation we've had today, we've had six wonderful presenters and the minister. I want to thank all of them. And the environment so often feels like such an overwhelming challenge. It's an existential generational challenge. And I think once COVID passes, the significance of the environmental challenge will come right into us once more. And sometimes I think we labor under the um, the, the great disabling uh, characteristic that because we can't do everything, we don't do anything. And this morning we've seen numerous examples of people doing something. And between science and human action and the arts, uh, these have all come together in this morning's uh, seminar to produce and present to us a part of our hinterland, a part of our country, a part of our civilization in this country that I think we have seen in a new way and place a new value on from this morning. So thank you to our presenters. A very particular thank you to, to the staff of and for Mishka, to Dono, um, Greta, Trina, and um, Angelo. And I suppose especially to Greta, who, who has pulled together this second seminar in our uh, in the past six months, and and hopefully we will we will be, we will be back with a further one later on in the year. Deepest thanks to our presenters for the research, for the excellence of their presentations. Thank you, everybody. As I said, all the presentations are available um, to you on the link that you will receive in an email 
uh, if you haven't already done so. So again, thank you. Take care.